science advances and enriches society, but it can only do so if it's left to run freely and openly. I'll illustrate how open science works through the eyes of CERN and also alert you to the dangers that are facing open science now. CERN. CERN is a laboratory uh, just down the valley near Geneva. It was uh, conceived just after the war by some of the greatest minds of our time, by scientists and diplomats. I'll let you work out which one's which. <laughs> they saw that the best way to uh, pick up the shards of broken Europe and to rebuild was to bring nations together through a common purpose, a purpose which transcends borders, transcends ideologies, through science. So CERN was founded in the uh, heart of Europe in neutral Switzerland. Since then, it's grown from strength to strength, and, and scientists from more than 120 different nations now come together and collaborate peacefully on science. But our visionary founding fathers also had one other excellent idea. They wrote into our convention that all the results of, of CERN's uh, research should be put openly out to the world. This was a fantastic early open science mandate. So what is our science? Our science is particle physics, the study of the fundamental building blocks of matter, the particles, and the forces by which they interact. And the way we do that is in colliders, where we, where we take particles that we know, accelerate them up to high energy, and collide them. And then through Einstein's famous equivalence equation, we convert the high energy into high mass new particles, unknown particles, that may not have existed since uh, moments after the Big Bang. And we use them to probe our knowledge of nature. So higher energy means bigger colliders. And that's what we've been doing ever since. But the first problem we faced, the first challenge, as you see in this uh, picture here, was that we'd built our first collider right on the border. And when we wanted to build the next one, the most attractive place was <coughs> just over in that lovely green field in France. So the first breakthrough was actually a geographic and diplomatic breakthrough where we managed to get a little piece of France cut off and attached to the CERN. <laughs> Since then, we've been building bigger and bigger colliders, culminating in the uh, flagship Large Hadron Collider, the LHC. This is the world's biggest and most complex scientific instrument, 27 kilometers long and buried 100 meters underground. Now, hold on, you say, buried. What are they hiding down there? <laughs> is that secret or dangerous? Well, actually, no, it's neither. Uh, you, we're an open lab. You can come and see what we're doing at any time. What we're doing is actually hiding it, not from you, but hiding it from the noisy cosmos. Here on the surface, there are cosmic rays going through us all the time at a rate of about one per second through an area the size of your hand. But you don't normally see them unless you go up to the, uh, the poles where you see what happens when they get trapped in uh, the Earth's magnetic field, and then they excite the uh, gas particles in the atmosphere into the beautiful aurora. Sometimes we want to study them. And in fact, one of CERN's uh, founding fathers, in addition, built another <coughs> laboratory just close to us here, up on the Col de Midi. He built a laboratoire des cosmiques to study cosmic rays. And it studied for 40 years before burning down and getting replaced by something perhaps a little bit more useful to the mountaineers of Chamonix, the Refuge des Cosmiques. So every time I go up there, I think of it as a tribute to science. <clears throat> now, that was a distraction, because cosmic rays are a distraction, uh, and that's why we build our detectors underground, so that 100 meters of, uh, of uh, Earth can protect us from the cosmic rays, and we can concentrate on our collisions. But just like mountaineers that push back the limits and they demand more and more from the equipment and the materials, that the, uh, the fabrics that the, uh, that the mountaineer in, the same is true of the explorers that we are, scientists exploring the frontiers of knowledge. We also are pushing back the limits of technology and driving innovation. An example of that is our detectors. In one of our detectors here, there are 100 million sensors of the latest technology. Sensors <coughs> such as scintillators that measure energy and uh, pixel detectors that measure tracks. Now, it was 
immediately evident that we could actually put these to other uses as well as for uh, imaging our collisions. And so we worked with doctors and hospitals to push this technology out into scanners. And that's what the PET scanner came from. And uh, it inspired other things like the MRIs. So the next time you go to a hospital for a scan, ask if you can just look behind that plastic uh, coving. And what you'll see is a mini particle detector, just like that. I also show you here in the middle, just for your interest, the, very the world's very first ever PET scan done at CERN. That's a mouse. No, honestly, that's a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> Things have improved a little since then. Okay. So openness sometimes is not enough. Sometimes you have to accompany a technology out to the world. Another example is from the 1970s, where our uh, collider operators um, could only interact with the, uh, the equipment through keyboards, like everybody else. But they said to our engineers, why can't we just touch the things that we see on the screen? So our engineers invented the capacitative touchscreen, and then they could. Again, this was immediately obvious that this could be useful to the world. So we went out and we told everyone that would listen. But unfortunately, we fell on deaf ears. The world wasn't ready for it. And so for many years, we've just had to content ourselves to playing with our own apps. <laughs> cool magnet, start accelerator. But luckily now, uh, the world has caught up and there are many more cool apps. Uh, and you can't imagine a world now without uh, a touch screen. So sometimes openness, again, is not enough. You need timeliness as well. And now on to our perhaps the most famous of, uh, of my examples. In 1989, a young computer scientist at CERN made a proposal. The computer scientist was called Tim Berners-Lee, the Tim. He made the proposal and put it on his boss's desk. His boss wrote back the next day with those immortal words, vague but exciting. <laughs> I think that's so apt for describing what revolutionized the entire world, the World Wide Web. Now, I said the Tim because, in fact, when I show visitors around the CERN Computer Center, the first question they always ask me is, are you the Tim? <laughs> and I have to disappoint them in saying, no, I'm just a Tim. We have lots at CERN. <clears throat> Anyway, the Tim, Sir Tim, went on to, to uh, build his invention, um, the World Wide Web, and it revolutionized the way that physicists interacted with information flow. Straight away, CERN could share its uh, results with physicists in any institute, and they could comment and share their ideas back to CERN. So within a few years, basically every physicist across the globe was connected on the World Wide Web. And at that moment, CERN made the momentous uh, decision to make a declaration in 1993. This declaration said that the World Wide Web software was free to the world. <coughs> they then put the next version of the software out under an open license, which guaranteed it would be free and open forever. And there the revolution started. The uh, servers spread from physics to other sciences, to industry, and basically, as you know now, Everybody, the entire world, has some connection one way or another with the web. So that little document I gave there is perhaps the most valuable document ever written because now the entire world economy runs on it. So sometimes openness needs guarantees because if we hadn't written that guarantee, someone might have appropriated it. Someone might have directed it, controlled it. But by making it guaranteed open, it to just evolve in the way that it had to, the people wanted it to, the imaginations took it, it meant it could be what it is today. So what is the problem then? So I've described how open science can lead to technology breakthroughs. Some of my colleagues in other TED Talks have described how open science can lead to knowledge breakthroughs. So the problem. Well, the problem is what I've been describing up until now are the forces of nature. But there are other forces, unfortunately, darker forces, that are pressing in on science at the moment. Commercial fo forces that want to exploit science. They want to stop the sharing until it's been uh, fully exploited. This stops other scientists commenting, other scientists using, other scientists checking. And this is an essential part of science, because science isn't always going forward. Sometimes you need to correct some things. So this is stifling science. The next force is the media force. 
which is trying to portray every experiment as a success and instantly usable. But again, science isn't like that. <clears throat> in science, what you discover may be useful only five years later, 10 years, 100 years later, but that doesn't matter because the best science is by curious minds investigating what they're interested in and working out what is useful later, not telling them they must discover something. That isn't science. Equally, science isn't about successes only. Negative results are as useful as positive results because they eliminate whole areas of study and they focus you on other more hopeful areas. Then perhaps the most uh, dark force of all, the political force, which is trying to hide and uh, suppress results. This isn't science. It's not sensible. Science is about describing the world as you find it and working with that, basing your decisions on facts. And that's what we really must demand of everybody. And perhaps the other surprising force is the digital force. You'd think in this digital age, everything is becoming easier. In fact, that's not the case. In the digital age, we can take more and more data. So much data, it's hard to share. We can write all of our algorithms in programs that mine all the data. But then all of the, uh, the, the clever parts of the, uh, the science are hidden in code. This makes it really, really difficult for others to use your science. So again, that's a huge pressure that we have to overcome. So what are we doing about this? So at CERN, the first thing we're doing is called open access. So as I said, those commercial forces are forcing publications into the mo most prestigious of journals, which are only affordable by the richest of countries uh, and the richest of universities. This is stopping the free flow of uh, information and science. Therefore, what we've done is we've made sure that every single LHC result is published open access. This means that we have paid up front for all of the uh, services and processing charges and whatever, and then the readers can access it for free, anywhere, forever. The next thing is open data. So we've probably got the biggest scientific data set in the world, 180 petabytes. That's huge. It's 180 million gigabytes. And yet, a few years ago, we decided we would open it up to the world. We wrote an open data portal, and we made hundreds of terabytes available, soon petabytes of available, along with the programs that you could use to analyze them. Now, of course, some thought this was risky. It is risky. It's risky because people might misinterpret the results. They might find something that we haven't. Well, it's unlikely, but they might do. We've got thousands <laughs> of people doing it, but perhaps they get there before us. Anyway, I liked one of the headlines that came out when we released this. The headline was, now you can search for dark matter on your sofa. <laughs> That's true. It has to be a pretty uh, well-equipped sofa, but you can. <clears throat> and the last thing we're doing is open communication. Perhaps our most uh, famous uh, discovery of uh, living memory, the Higgs boson. So if you roll back time to 1964, three physicists invented a mechanism, Brout, Englert, and Higgs, that would explain why particles had mass. This was an essential part of our standard model for, of, the, of uh, the universe, and we've been investigating it for the 50 years since. We found every other part of that uh, standard model is true, but we couldn't find this last missing piece of the puzzle. In fact, it was one of the reasons why the LHC was built, was to try and find the Higgs. So when we started the LHC, um, we, we also thought in advance of the fact that science needs verification. And it was extremely unlikely that someone else would build an LHC. So we built two independent experiments that would take data independently and analyze them independently, both searching for that little bump that would show the Higgs, a bump in a distribution at a certain energy, which meant a certain mass of the Higgs that would signal the discovery. Now, perhaps in other walks of life, they might have cross-checked the results, but that's not science. We decided that we would do an open seminar at which the two independent teams re re announced their independent results without any collusion and any checking. And we invited the world to watch as well to see how open science was done. And amazingly, on that webcast, a half a million people watched live as 200 detailed slides of scientific evidence was presented. Absolutely incredible. And later on, the same uh, information was rebroadcast to more than a billion TV spectators. So this was science at its best. Luckily, 
Each one found a bump, and the bumps lined up. The Higgs was discovered, and open science basically triumphed. So we're lucky. We're lucky that we can face these dark forces because we're well organized and well equipped. But not all sciences are uh, that fortunate. And my appeal here is that we must help all of the science to remain open, such that it really can, as open science, lead to breakthroughs in our understanding, breakthroughs in our technology, and breakthroughs in our society. Thank you.